sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, worship Your holy name. You're rich in love and you're slow to anger. Your name is great. And your heart is kind For all your goodness I will keep on singing Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find Bless the Lord, oh my soul Oh my soul Worship His whole strength is failing, the end draws near, and my time is come, still my soul will sing your praise unending, ten thousand years and then forevermore, forevermore, so bless the Lord, oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship Your holy name. Bless the Lord, oh, my soul. Oh, my soul, worship His holy name. God is mighty to save. Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness. Kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. The author of salvation. Jesus conquered the grave. So 
Take me as you find me All my fears and failures Fill my life again I give my life to follow Everything I believe in Now I surrender Savior, ye can move the mountains My God is mighty to save He is mighty to save Forever, author of salvation Heroes and conquerors Conquer the grave Shine your light and let the whole world see We're singing for the glory of the risen King Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see We're singing for the glory of the risen King Savior, He can my God is mighty to save, He is mighty to save, forever, author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave, Savior, He can move the mountains, my God is mighty to save, He is mighty to save. salvation heroes and conquer the grave Jesus conquer the Such 
Him for his wonderful grace. Thank you for this opportunity to be in your house this morning. We pray that that would be the prayer of our hearts, that uh, we'd have a hunger for you, Lord God, and that uh, you alone can fill that. And praise you. We just pray this morning that you'd open uh, our hearts and our minds as Pastor Ryan gives us a, a message from you, and may it bless you and glorify your name. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Kevin and worship team. You may not have been aware, but uh, we, my family and I, were on vacation this past week. That's why we weren't here this last Sunday. And if you recall, then the Sunday before that, Sarah had to, maybe some of you realized, some of you did not, but we didn't have the full family here because we had sick kids at home. Hannah was staying with Carissa, who was home 
sick, and during the time while I was praying that Sunday, my pocket started vibrating with my cell phone because Hannah was calling to say, Mom, Dad, Chris is puking. Basically, I need help. And so, you know, that was, anyway, that, it is what it is. Well, since then, during our vacation, then Isaac spiked a fever, you know, and so he was sick for a couple of days while we were on vacation. And now Sarah's not here this morning because Hannah is sick. There's five down and there's one left to go. <laughs> I, am the, I am the last man standing. And so I'm hoping that uh, we don't get an adventure here this morning, you know. <clears throat> but we had a nice time. Uh, refreshing and, and uh, bonding as a family this past week. So we just want to thank you for the privilege to be able to do that. In 1963, a man by the name of Dr. Lawrence theorized something that he called the butterfly effect. Are you familiar with the, what the butterfly effect is? Primarily what it means is that there could be a butterfly on the opposite side of the world that by the power of flapping its wings would thus change the atmospheric pressure enough by one butterfly flapping its wings that it would culminate and it would build and build and create a hurricane on the other side of the world. And in 1963, when he first presented his theory, he was basically laughed off of the stage that he was presenting it to in front of a bunch of scientists. And now scientists are looking back at that and saying, wow, there is some, I'm not saying a butterfly can cause a hurricane, but there is some truth to the reality that seems like small things or things that seemingly are insignificant tend to build and affect other things into almost a snowball, and you have the, a major culmination of events. And we see that sometimes in our culture. We see that sometimes in our lives. And I, I have theorized my own theory, and it's somewhat unrelated, but I, I believe that I have, have come up with what I call the canary effect, and what the canary effect pretty much states, and this is, this is for me because I think this is a gift that God has given to me, that if I'm in a comfortable place and the lights go out, I fall asleep. <laughs> Likewise, a canary, because you put a canary in a cage, you know, and then you put, you know, you've heard the proverb, you put a blanket over the canary's cage, the bird falls asleep. And I think that that's what I have. And, and that's a really, it's, it's a blessing for me because when you're in a, a place and you're comfortable and you're tired and you put the lights out, boom, I'm out. There's some in our household who have, I guess, not chronic, but in some degrees, in some days, insomnia. And that can be a very frustrating gift for them to watch the other person have. When lights go out, they're asleep, here I am, still awake, it can create some conflicts. At, at certain times. And my mom has this gift, but now her gift is a little bit different where she can be virtually anywhere. It doesn't have to be a comfortable place. She can sleep on buses. She can sleep on planes. She can sleep in the car. I'm pretty sure she could sleep on a bicycle. <laughs> okay. And, and she's got this gift. I mean, she can kind of sleep anywhere. I think Isaac, our son, is the one, he's kind of inherited that aspect where that kid can sleep and he can sleep anytime. He hits, head, hits the pillow and he is out. I was able to attempt to exercise this gift when we were in the Dominican Republic, but there was a problem. This is where I kind of came, I, I, I further articulated my theory because for me, it's not just about the lights going out. I find that I have to be comfortable first. And when you're cross-cultural in that sense, it's very difficult. So on the way there, we had two plane rides. I don't know how many hours it was, but there's, for me, it was pretty much impossible to sleep on the plane. And I had flashbacks to our previous missions trip to Oaxaca, Mexico, when you have a five-hour bus ride, and it's impossible to sleep on a five-hour bus ride through the mountains of Oaxaca. It's not possible without some form of chemical help, Okay. <laughs> And, and I learned in that trip to Oaxaca that there is such a form of chemical help. And I, I, I thought that if I was ever to travel and I was allowed one medication, one thing, it wouldn't be ibuprofen. You might die of a splitting headache, but it wouldn't be ibuprofen. It wouldn't be Imodium. You know what Imodium does, right? It wouldn't be that. It would be Dramamine. Dramamine is the magic pill. Because I don't normally get motion sickness, but on that trip to Oaxaca, I certainly did a number of years ago. But this Dramamine, I learned the intrinsic value of Dramamine on that trip. And so what we did on the way home then, because I didn't sleep at all on the way to the Dominican. On the way home, Sarah and I, we had to strategize. We each had in our hand one Dramamine. 
Okay. I know, right? And so we're, we're getting on a plane. Just before we board the plane, we had it timed because you take it too early, you're going to miss your flight. You know, that's just the reality. Uh, so we had it timed perfectly. So they're, they're doing the boarding calls. All right, we take it now. So as long as I can step onto the plane, they can drag me to my seat if I need to. But we, we took the Dramamine, and it was like gold, where I fell asleep. It doesn't matter what position. You know, because you get, the older you get, you find that you can't bend in certain ways anymore like you previously could bend. Uh, Chris just this morning came up to me and gave me a hug as I was leaving the house because she stayed home, home with the kids. She gave me a hug, and so she comes up and she hugs me, and she, she looks up like this, and she puckers up like she wants to kiss. Okay, here I am, and here's her here. I don't bend that way. You know, I'm sorry, it's not going to happen, so I just take her forehead and, you know, kiss her on the forehead. That's about all you can do. But anyway, I don't bend like that, and so you're in these planes, and you have no leg room, and you're just, like, folded in half, but with drama, I mean, it really didn't matter. I mean, <laughs> that's bad. Okay, that, anyway. Um, <clears throat> but the fact of the matter is, I, I've learned that without the drama, I mean, unless I can find myself getting comfortable, it's just not going to happen. And so, we're going to look this morning at this reality. It's going to be some, some tough stuff that we're going to look at. We're going to look at the book of Ecclesiastes. If you're familiar with the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon lays out this experiment, this extensive experiment where he's trying to find something intrinsically value in this, valuable in this life that we live. And so he tries all of these different things. He tries pleasures. He tries laughter. He tries, uh, I believe it was probably chemicals. He tries uh, sex. He tries all of these things to try to find something meaningful in this life that we live, and he specifies it as this life that we live under the sun, and we're going to look at that a little bit further. And we're going to find ourselves being stretched with this reality of, wow, that's kind of uncomfortable to read. And we're going to find ourselves, we're going to see some images on the, on the screen this morning that's going to be, wow, that's, that's not really comfortable to look at. As we go on these missions experiences, I find that the most impactful moments, and this is myself speaking, and I think I can speak freely for the team, but some of the most impactful moments that we find on these missions experiences is when students or when team members find that they have reached the end of themselves, and they realize that this I can't handle any longer. In other words, what it is, okay, so we go on these trips, well, this is okay, I'm comfortable here. And finally, when we reach the end of our discomfort, now there's no longer any rest. I'm not comfortable anymore. I'm being stretched. This kind of hurts. I'd rather not endure this any longer. So we've learned that over, the to- over these years, that we have to have these stretching experiences. And when we have these stretching experiences, God really speaks to us in those times of our discomfort. And we're going to look at what, what Solomon has to say on some of these aspects this morning. Three weeks ago, when this team reported on our Dominican trip, there was one aspect that was left off. And it wasn't intentionally left off. It just had really to do with with timing and and things that were going to be shared. This just didn't fit in there. And we're going to bring that back up to the surface here this morning. Sarah wanted to, at that last service, to be able to share that. And she wanted to share it this morning. And she can't share it this morning. But she wrote it out, and I'm going to read it after a little bit. And we're going to see what she has to say and how she was impacted. But what we find is that when we're looking at these trips and we find ourselves at the end of the stretching point, that's when God moves. And so we were in the Dominican. We had spent, you know, the Saturday we had arrived. We get acclimated. Sunday, there's our ministry starts. We did prayer walks. And then we have our VBS and our our basketball uh, ministry. So we have these ministry days. And we get through Wednesday, which was our last ministry day. And now we have Thursday, which was a day of relaxation, a day of comfort, if you will. And then we have Friday, and originally when we were working out the itinerary with the, the missions organization, that was a fairly open day as well. And so we had two days of comfort. And I, in my discussions with the ministry organization, I said, I'm not, I'm not okay with that. I think we need to stretch. Something else needs to happen on that Friday. What else can we do that's going to stretch it? And so I knew this going into it. So we get to, we have our day of, our Thursday, our day of relaxation. We get to Friday. And we're traveling from Barahona, the four hours back to Santo Domingo. And I know what's coming because it's been told to me. And so we're in this bus ride, and I'm finding myself, you know, I'm comfortable here, and I'm ready to be done. I'm ready to stay comfortable. 
And I know that where they're taking us is to this orphanage, and I've been prefaced a little bit ahead of time on what this orphanage entails and what we're going to encounter at this orphanage. And I'm finding myself, I'm speaking for myself, I'm finding myself that as we're traveling this bus ride, you know, I really would rather just stay comfortable right now. And yet I know in the deepest part of my heart that God is calling us to step out of our comfort and to be uncomfortable, that I need this, that the team needs this, and so we need to encounter this. And so where we're going is uh, an orphanage called the Casa de Luz, the House of Light. And what the House of Light is, you can look it up online, especially if you speak Spanish, because it's all written in Spanish. But what the Casa de Luz is, is it's an orphanage in which the, the orphans that are there, most of them, and when I say most, it's not just like 51%. It would be about 90% of them have been abandoned by family. When I say abandoned, it happens in one of two ways. Sometimes the families will just drop them off at the orphanage and leave. Sometimes they will drop them off on the sidewalk and leave. And that, that's hard enough. But then you see, I hate to use this phrase, but you, you, under, you see why they've done it. And it breaks your heart because the reason that they have dropped off these children is, is they have physical and, in most cases, physical and mental disabilities. They're extremely difficult to obviously know how to, to raise and to care for. But instead of learning how to do that, and I'm not trying to cast judgment. I'm just trying to give a perspective. And so they drop them off. And so they're, they've been abandoned. And the... the orphanage that you're going to see some pictures of in a little bit. The orphanage loves these kids. The director of the orphanage had a son <clears throat> who had uh, extreme mental and physical disabilities, and he was told that his son wouldn't live past the age of 12. His son lived till he was 22. And when his son died, he was burdened to care for others like his son. And so he began this orphanage. And I don't remember the numbers. I would, I would put it at maybe between one to two dozen uh, kids that are there as part of the, the orphanage. And every one of them is extremely disabled, whether it's physical, mental, or both. And it's an extremely challenging place to go. So as we're driving to this orphanage, I'm finding myself, I don't know that I'm ready for this. I don't know that I want this. And yet I know that God is saying, you need this. And so, I mean, we're not going to change it, but I just, I'm wrestling with the Lord in my own heart as we're traveling. Okay, okay, Lord, you need to prepare me for this then. You know, I don't know how it's going to go. I don't know how it's going to go down. I don't know how we're going to re react and interact. I don't know what we're going to experience totally. I've just been kind of brought up something in the Lord. I just really felt you're going to see something powerful here and something powerful is going to happen here and you need to be a part of that and these students need to be a part of that. And so we go. And we arrive at, at the orphanage. And this is where I've asked Sarah to share a little bit of her experience. And so I'm going to read, since she can't be here this morning, I'm going to read what she has written. Can we get the slides up here too? So this was the verse that you see on the wall um, at the orphanage. And this is what it says. But Jesus said, let the little children come to me and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of heaven. And this is what Sarah writes. I don't know that anyone could have been prepared for what we experienced that day. Yes, we knew the kids were orphans. We even knew most had disabilities. But who knew that many would be bound to their beds or wheelchairs just for their own safety? And so that's a reality. As many of these, these kids were actually tied. You can't really see it, but many of them were actually tied. It wasn't for cruelty, it was for their own protection. Otherwise, they may throw themselves out of their cribs, out of their wheelchairs, etc. So it was, it was a protection aspect. You know, so how do, you, how do you prepare yourselves to step into something like that and to see that? Sarah continues, the rooms were brightly painted and the children and bedding clean and well cared for. Staff buzzed around, caring gently for each resident, giving massages and therapy to keep them as mobile as possible. So they would work them. And this is, this is daily. And Sarah talked to one of the caregivers there, and that caregiver puts in eight hours a day. And there's others, but that caregiver that she spoke to specifically puts in eight hours a day, seven days a week. I mean, there is no 
break. There's no vacation, and that's what she does. That's, that's her job, is to love on these people. And so they would oftentimes, if you've ever had to care for those kinds of needs, they would have to, to work their, their legs. They'd have to do the extensions. They'd have to do the range of motion exercises. Sarah writes, I made my way around each room, taking in the sights and the sounds. What stuck out to me first were the number of cribs. I saw one labeled with a child's name, a little girl, the age of eight. I immediately thought of my healthy eight-year-old Carissa, able to walk and talk on her own while her counterpart was still in a crib, thin and unable to hardly move. Similarly, I had the same encounter in the boys' room when I saw a crib labeled with a boy's name age nine, same age as Isaac. The tears came freely at that point. Knowing what a healthy eight and nine-year-old child would look like, still I felt almost paralyzed to interact. Could they understand me? What were their stories? Are they infected? I hate to admit it, but I was scared to even reach out and to touch them. And then Sarah writes, that's when I saw a very vivid encounter. Michael Gross, and this is the encounter that she saw. Michael Gross standing over the bed of a young child, staring into her eyes until he made eye contact. He reached out and touched her. Similarly, I watched others. Canyon, Tickle, many others started reading stories. Then the verse came to mind, whatever you do for the least of these, my brothers, you do for me. I was being led to connect, to reach out, and to touch what almost seemed to be untouchable. I thought a stuffed animal would be a safe way to begin interactions. A red mini baseball player pillow pet looked carefully through the crib bars to catch her attention. I saw her eyes draw to the red and the movement. Then it was reading her a story. Then something came over me that I wanted to treat her as my own child. I almost forgot she didn't even know me. I sang, Jesus loves me in Spanish. I saw her smile as I did this little piggy with her toes. And she really liked when I would take a picture and show it to her on my camera. What had started as an act of obedience to the scripture turned into an intimate interaction I learned her name to be Haroline, and she is five years old. We only had a short time together, but still I feel a love for this young girl. For me, God was asking me to be obedient in reaching out and touching these kids. And that's what they wanted. That's what they needed. This is a a young gal. I don't know her name. And this is humbling for me to say, and so I'm just... I'll be open and honest. I'm reading her a story, and she can't keep her hands off me. I know, right? (laughs) Uh, I should not have said that. Uh, Anyway, so she she reaches out, and she's she's holding my hand, and she's, she's taking it. And she reaches up, and she's grabbing my head, and she's just, I mean, she's moving it, and she's doing whatever she wants to with it. But it was hard because there is a, there's a moment before you allow this to happen where you have to make the decision, okay, I'm going to do this because God, this is what God is calling me to do. There's, there's a challenge with it, you know, and, and you can kind of see, and I'm humbled to say it, but her hand was covered with that. Yep, I got it all over me, you know, but... God was calling me, and I'm speaking for me, God was calling me to something, some way to interact, and it was, it was to touch, and it was to impact these kids. And I didn't do anything. I read, I'm reading a story in Spanish. I don't speak Spanish. I don't read Spanish. This was brutal. And while I'm doing this, I had another gal in a wheelchair. She could speak. She was, she was uh, fairly um, physically disabled, but mentally she, she had a pretty good capacity. And she wheels over to me, and as I'm reading, she's, I mean, she's correcting every word that I'm saying. <laughs> it's like, I'm, come on, I'm doing the best that I can, okay? But that's, that's what we encountered. 
and to step in and, and to face that. And there was a question that was asked by one of our students. Where is God in this? You know, because you see what you're encountering and, encountering and, and, and where does God fit in this? And so let's look into the book of Ecclesiastes. We're going to look at chapters, not, not long segments. We're going to look through this and we're going, to, we're going to engage with it. We're going to see what Solomon has to say. And he's not going to obviously be talking about the same orphanage that we're talking about in this sense. But he's going to give us this perspective. We're going to see this idea of injustice. We're going to see this idea of oppression that happens here. And then we're going to counter, co- contrast that with a passage out of, out of the New Testament in Luke chapter 5 after a little bit. And we'll see what Christ does and how he interacts with the people that are oppressed. And so in, in chapter 3 of Ecclesiastes, just before this, you know, this is part of his great experiment, just before this in, in verses 1, we have that the very famous and well-known, there's a time for everything and a season and every activity under heaven. I know Mark's here going, turn, turn, turn from the song, but we're not going to sing at this point. So we get into verse 16. And, and Solomon says this. He says, I saw something else under the sun. It's important to note that he's saying under the sun because this is an earthly view that he's taking right now. Okay, because he says some things in here that we could look at and we could say, wow, what, Solomon, he's, he's saying this, he's saying this. Well, that, that changes what I, my perspective was. We got to keep it in, in perspective. He's speaking of under the sun. He's speaking, this is earthly terms. If I look just as a human, if I look just as in a, someone who has been put on this earth through earthly eyes, this is what I'm going to see, and it's going to be appear pretty meaningless. So anyway, so he says, And I saw something else under the sun. In the place of judgment, wickedness was there. And in the place of justice, wickedness was there. You know, and as we go through this, we're going to find that what we just saw and what we read, it can be very depressing. And so before I go any further, I, I, I want to offer up this, this, this uh, peak at hope. And if you look back just into verse 14, just a couple of verses back, Solomon says, I know that everything God does will endure forever Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken away from it. And then we can even include verse 13, the end of it. This is the gift from God that everyone may eat and drink and find satisfaction in his toil. But there's this idea that everything that God does endures. Yes, we can toil on this earth. We can put in our work. And a lot of our work is going to be temporary here. But if God has his hand on it, the temporary work that we have done suddenly becomes eternal. Does that make sense? And we find, in, if we look into Ecclesiastes chapter 12 as well, we find that there's, there's this beacon of hope when he concludes the matter. He says, now that all has been heard, here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commands, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment including every hidden thing, whether good or evil. And so Solomon gives us this, this peak of hope here even in verse 14, but then he's going he's to get to it in chapter, chapter 12. But here we have this now in verse 16. And I saw something else under the sun in the place of judgment where there should have been justice, there was wickedness. And I thought in my heart, God will bring to judgment both the righteous and the wicked, for there will be a time for every activity, a time for every deed. In other words, Solomon is saying, you know, God's going to make this right in his time. And I don't have to understand it right now. I'm looking at it under the sun. I don't understand it. I don't get it. But God's going to make it right in his time. And so these are tough questions. So where is God in all of this? Sometimes I don't know. Sometimes the answer is, right now, I don't know. But for everything that God does, it's eternal. God works eternally, and he uses us. We have been created to be eternal. You understand what I'm saying? We haven't just been created for this time and this place. We have been created eternal, for eternity. And he's got a plan for us, yes, to do here, but it's to do the things that he wants us to be doing for his sake of eternity. And so then we continue. And we're going to find that that in the midst of, of seeing these injustices and in the midst of these oppressions that we're about to read, we got to know how to respond. Because oftentimes when we see injustice, what do we do? 
Exactly. You get angry. When you see something that's unjust, you get angry. If you're driving down the road and someone mistreats you with their bad driving habits, it makes you angry. And then what, in our minds, what becomes justice? You get them or see them being pulled over just a few miles ahead. You know, right? There. <laughs> Serves you right. But if the tables are turned, is that justice for us now to suddenly see ourselves being pulled over? No. We don't see it that way. We don't want to look at it that way. We'd rather be comfortable than to see things the way that they are. And so sometimes when we're in the midst of discomfort, I pop a Dramamine. And I try to overlook it because I want to stay comfortable as opposed to being faced with the injustices that we see. Or I just get angry that I can't sleep. You see the parallel? And so when we're faced with injustice, we can either get angry or we can see our own humility. It'd be like looking into a mirror. Okay, I've just been wronged. You, you suddenly pull up a mirror, not while you're driving. That would be very dangerous. Uh, you pull up a mirror and you look at yourself in this mirror. And you start to see the injustices that exist there in front of you. And then maybe that can give you a perspective towards the injustices that are happening elsewhere and maybe even against you. And then we look at the oppression. And when we're faced with oppression, what's our reaction oftentimes on oppression? Boy, that makes me uncomfortable. And so I tend to push it away, not look at it, and develop an apathy. And I think God's calling us to compassion and empathy as opposed to apathy. There's a big difference between empathy and apathy. And so when we look at the scripture here now, starting in verse 18, we're going to move on. I also thought... As for men, God tests them so that they may see what they are, that they are like the animals. Remember, this is under the sun perspective. Solomon in no way is saying that mankind has been created to be just like the animals. However, looking at it from man's perspective, this is how it looks. Because if you look at that, this is what we have. Man's fate is that like the animals. The same fate awaits them both. As one dies, so dies the other. All have the same breath. Man has no advantage over the animals. Everything is meaningless. You saw it that these kids in the orphanage were, in a sense, many of them treated like animals. You know, I got a dog. He's old. I'm going to get rid of him. And so looking at it from man's standards, there's not a lot of difference. So what's the difference then? If I'm looking at it from man's standards, what's the difference between getting rid of my pet and getting rid of this child that I have in my home because I can't handle it. And I know that there's challenge. I'm, I'm, don't, don't take that where, where I'm not intending it to go, but I'm telling you that there's value. There's a different value that God places on it because mankind has been created to be eternal. And that automatically gives us a higher value when we have been created to be eternal. So automatically we have a higher value. So every one of those kids has been created to be eternal. We don't understand why they have the oppression that they have, the physical and maybe the mental oppression. We don't understand that, but I don't need to necessarily understand that. I just need to understand that they have been created to be eternal just like I have been created to be eternal. And they have needs. Their needs might be a little bit different than mine, but we have a lot of the same needs. And one of those needs that we're going to see is touch. And so looking at it from man's standards, there's no difference between animal and man. Everything is meaningless. He uses that word meaningless. We see that so often. What's fascinating, if you break that, that word down in the original Hebrew, it basically it's, it's this idea of meaningless. It's, it's vapor. It's, it's here and it's gone. And, and the word that's used is hebel. And it's the same word, that was given to Adam and Eve's second son. Did you know that? Abel. That's the root. It's Abel. It's, in other words, it's temporary. And so looking at this, it's meaningless, but this meaningless is temporary. It's for this earth. The earth has its degree of meaningless when you look at it only from earthly standards, but when you can understand what God has done, you take these meaningless things here, and now you'll suddenly understand there is eternal value. You know, if I, if I go and help my neighbor, all right, let's, I don't know where that leads, 
but maybe that butterfly effect like we talked about in the beginning, maybe that leads them to ask questions. Maybe that leads them into a relationship with Christ. Suddenly my, my simple act, let's say, of helping them mow their lawn it seems so basic. And yet, you see its eternal value when that relationship has encountered the creator of the eternal. And so we go on. All, this is verse 20, all go to the same place. This is animals and mankind. All come from the dust, all to the dust return. And who knows if the spirit of man rises up and the spirit of the animal goes down to the earth. So I saw that there is nothing better for man than to enjoy his work because this is his lot. For who can bring him to see what will happen after him? That's the earthly perspective. Keep that in mind. And then four more verses in Ecclesiastes, chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. Again, I looked and saw all the oppression that was taking place under the sun. Did you know, looking at some of these reports, if you watch the news, if you listen to the news, some of the statistics on these mass shootings is oppressing. Mass shootings have increased in frequency from 1.1 per year to 4.5 a year since the 1970s. And the report that was, that was made, sent to members of Congress on Friday, found that in the 1970s, mass public shootings killed roughly six people a year and injured two. And from 2010 to 2013, there was an average of 33 deaths in mass shootings each year with 28 additional people injured. How do you deal? I mean, is there an answer? There's... What do you do with that? I mean, talk about oppressing. Talk about depressing. And you, you, you find yourself, okay, what can you do with it? Well, I can turn off the TV. I can pretend it doesn't exist. And I can get apathetic. Well, those things are just going to happen. Or I can allow the Lord to use these things to create in me compassion and I can't maybe change the things that are happening in Tennessee or Colorado or some of these places where these things have happened. However, I think that the, the pain that the person or the pe perpetrators are, are experiencing perhaps can be encountered in our communities as well. And if I can start to see things from compassion and empathy and avoid the apathy, then maybe I can have an impact on someone that is here around me the people that God has put into my life and into my path. So my injustice and how I view it should lead to humility and not anger. And when I encounter the oppression, it needs to lead to compassion and empathy as opposed to apathy. So I want to contrast it. Now we're running out of time. I want to contrast this. So we've seen this. We've seen these pictures that we have of the orphans. We've, we've looked at what Solomon has to say in here. Did I even finish it? I didn't, did I? So he says, I saw the tears of the oppressed, and they have no comforter. Power was on the side of their oppressors, and they have no comforter. And I declare that the dead who had already died are happier than the living who are still alive. There are some in our world who would say, those kids are better off dead. They'll be happier dead. From an earthly standpoint, it's hard to argue. From under the sun, that's hard to argue. But when you look at the eternal, I can't buy it. But better than both is he who has not yet been, who has not seen the evil that is done under the sun. And I saw that all the labor and all the achievement that spring from man's envy of his neighbor, this too is meaningless. This too is that vapor. This too is just that passing, that temporary, a chasing after the wind. And so we see that. And now we're going to look at, okay, we have the oppressors. We have those who are oppressed. And we're going to see the contrast that Jesus offers in Luke chapter 5. So look with me into Luke chapter 5, starting at verse 12. And while Jesus was in one of the towns, a man came along who was covered with leprosy. Leprosy is a bacterial infection and basically left untreated, it literally eats, it's like a flesh-eating disease, and it, it eats the body away, and, and you're left with death, nothing. And so Jesus encounters this man who's covered with leprosy. 
He has all these sores on him. And, and lepers would have been outcasts. They would have been oppressed socially. They would not have been allowed to even participate or be near anyone else because they were certainly considered unclean. I don't want to ke- catch what you have. I don't want to touch you. I don't want to be near you. And so lepers had their own colonies at times, if you will, where they were the only ones that could be together. And everyone else was just, sorry, you're out. And so Jesus encounters this man who has been oppressed for most of his life because no one will even talk with him, engage with him, touch him, and watch what Jesus does to this leprous man. While Jesus was in one of the towns, a man came along who was covered with leprosy. When he saw Jesus, he fell on his face to the ground and begged him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man and said, I am willing, be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. And Jesus ordered, don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for cleansing as a testimony to them. And yet the news about him spread all the more. So the crowds of people came to hear him and be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. And this is, this is the passage that kept going through my mind and my heart as we're encountering these students, these kids at the Casa de Luz. Jesus touched them. And so here I have this girl, and all, all she's got on her hand is spit, drool, saliva. She's not covered with leprosy. And it took effort, but I touched her hand. And as soon as that happened, I mean, it was, she did not want to let go. So I'm convinced, okay, so we have, we have something that we need to wrestle with this morning. We have something that we need to be able to, to engage and to answer with this morning. We have, number one, when we face injustices, how are we going to re- respond? Are we just going to get angry? Are we going to learn some humility and understanding? Okay, how can I relate to this injustice? How can, how can I play a part in it? The other aspect is the oppression. When I engage in the oppression, am I going to just willingly say, I want to stay comfortable, pop my drama mean, and go to sleep? Or am I willing to say, oh, this is really uncomfortable. But I believe that God has something for me here, and I need to stay engaged with it. In other words, am I going to understand the empathy and the compassion that God is calling me to and avoid the apathy to it? And that really kind of boils down to this. And I believe this is really the message that God wants to get across this morning to me, and I believe to all of you. And I believe that for several reasons. One is Sarah was preparing her statement. I was preparing mine. We hadn't even corroborated on our stuff yet. And she didn't even know officially that I was even going to be asking her to speak. And she wrote this, and it was her last line. I'm going to read that as I kind of, uh, as soon as I find it again. I'm going to read that because she sums it up, and it's nearly word for word as to what I had put. She says this, who is God asking you to touch today? There are people all around us that simply need to be touched. And, and I'm speaking physically. Okay, they simply need to be touched. They need to be touched. There's power in the act of touching, whether it's hugging, whether it's not slapping. That would be mean. But there's power in the act of touching, especially someone who has been cast out and sees themselves as untouchable, to be able to engage them. There's also the idea of emotional and spiritual touching as well. To be able to engage in a person and to not avoid the person because ah, talking with that person can be really uncomfortable. God might be calling you to engage with that person even if it's uncomfortable. God may be asking you to touch someone specifically even though it may be really uncomfortable. God might be asking you to share your faith with someone as spiritual touching, even though it might be really uncomfortable. So I'm convinced that there are people in our lives that God wants us to touch this morning. Who has God put in your life that he wants you to touch this morning? We need to pray. As I pray, Kevin, worship team, if you'd come.
Let's pray. Father, it's difficult to find ourselves willing to be uncomfortable. And it's difficult to see injustices and not become angry. It's difficult to see the injustices that exist in our own lives. And it's difficult to see the oppression that exists in this world and to allow it to create into us compassion and empathy. It's so much easier and more comfortable to become apathetic towards it. But perhaps even the most challenging thing is to touch those who you have called us to touch. Because we know that that oftentimes will lead us into areas of discomfort. And we don't like to be uncomfortable. So I pray that your spirit will move this morning in such a way that we will not only see who you need us to touch, but Lord, that you will also impassion us, give us the courage and the bravery to do what it is that you've asked us to do, and that's to touch people in our community, in our workplaces, in our schools, in our homes, to be able to touch people for your sake, for your glory, for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. There's no space that love can reach There's no place where we can't find peace There's no end to amazing grace Take me in with your arms spread wide Take me in like an orphan child Never let go, never leave my side I am holding on to you, I am holding on to you, in the middle of the storm, I'm holding on, I am. Love like this, oh my God, to find, I am overwhelmed with a joy divine, love like this in the hearts of fire. I am holding on to you, I am holding on to you, in the middle of the storm, I'm holding on, I am. This is my resurrection song, this is my hallelujah call, this is why to you I run. There's no space for His love can't reach. There's no place where we can't find peace. There's no end to amazing grace. I am holding on to you. I am holding on to you. In the middle of the storm, I'm holding on. I am. Holding on to you, I am holding on to you. In the middle of the storm, I'm holding on, I am. In the middle of the storm, I'm holding on, I am. Thank you. Are dismissed.